Okay, so before I start off this list, full disclaimer, I don't go see every big movie that comes out in the year. I really only want to see stuff that I think is good and has some potential. And if I make a negative review about it, well, that's just because it disappointed me significantly. So you're not going to see a lot of popular worst of the year choices like the Emoji Movie, Resident Evil The Final Chapter, The Bye Bye Man, Wish Upon, Underworld Blood Wars, Chips, The Boss Baby, Monster Trucks. Wait, that was real? Really? <sighs> Fuck it. Let's just get this over with. Number 10. If you're a DC fan, be thankful this is on the bottom of the list, but in all honesty, when a Justice League movie is your least favorite comic book movie of the year, and one that is filled with solo movies that are a lot smaller in scale, that's not the greatest sign. There were good character moments, there were some decent fight scenes, but the story was all over the place. There were too many subplots that either conclude just like that, or they don't wrap up at all. Aquaman, once again, barely gets to use his underwater powers. You know, the things that make him awesome, badass, make him stand out from everyone else. And Steppenwolf was just such a boring villain. He actually makes Marvel villains look complex. Really think about that. I'll say this, A Cure for Wellness is a beautiful looking movie. Gore Verbinski is a talented director who doesn't rely on gore and violence to scare people, despite his first name. He actually likes to take his time and build up the suspense in each scene, and he creates a cool gothic atmosphere. The problem is, he either takes too much time, or not enough. It kind of went back and forth sometimes. The movie is two and a half hours long, and it did not need to be. I appreciate the fact that you're trying to tell the story visually, but in order to do that, some scenes do need to take their time, yes. But that's so other scenes can have a much quicker pacing, and A Cure for Wellness didn't have that. Plus, Danae DeHaan basically mumbled throughout the entire movie. I don't get what people see in him as an actor. He just... It just doesn't seem like he's trying. Matt Damon, Julianne Moore, Oscar Isaac, and George Clooney directing an old Coen Brothers script. Suburbicon should have been good, but it wasn't. And here's why. It had two underdeveloped stories happening at once. And I kind of get why he shoved the subplot about racism in the background of a cliched crime drama, as stupid as that sounds. But the reason I didn't care about that is because I don't know any of the characters who are even involved in the subplot. The only reason you're supposed to feel sorry for this family who is suffering from severe persecution is that they're just black. It doesn't matter what their personalities are like or what their pros and cons are. All you have to do is feel sorry for them just because they're black, and that's all. Black people are interesting, you know? Like, you can try and develop them. I'm just gonna stop talking now. I only remember bits and pieces about life and not the whole thing. What I do know for sure is that it borrowed a lot from Alien and Gravity without really trying to hide it. In fact, a co-worker of mine actually mistook the trailer for life for Alien Covenant. And it's a little easy to understand why, but the only thing that life didn't borrow from Alien were the memorable characters or the scares. I mean, I like Jake Gyllenhaal, Rebecca Ferguson, and Ryan Reynolds in this movie, but that's mostly because they're just good actors in general. But here, they don't have enough characteristics or redeeming qualities that are good enough to make us feel scared for them when their lives are in danger. And it doesn't help that most of the scares in this movie just come out of nowhere with no buildup whatsoever. Life is just completely forgettable at best. I know this may seem strange ranking Covenant as a worse film than life, but the reason for that is, even though Michael Fassbender is terrific as always, and really Scott, as usual, is good at directing sci-fi, it pisses me off that because so many people didn't like Prometheus, a movie that took chances, that had a lot of smart things to say about creation and life, and in my opinion stood on its own from the other Alien movies as a spin-off. That Ridley Scott just takes a safer route for this movie by following the formula of every single Alien movie that came before it, and by explaining everything to the audience like they're completely stupid, and yet it still tries to be a Prometheus sequel, and it fails at both. Billy Crudup advances the plot by being the worst space captain ever, 
making a ton of stupid decisions and putting his entire crew at risk. And even worse, he's making Danny McBride look smart. Hell, James Franco was in the first two minutes of this movie just to die. And I know that he was in that short film, The Last Supper, that is supposed to take place before Covenant, but guess what he does in The Last Supper? He gets sick, then he goes to bed. The fuck do you need James Franco for? The Dark Tower makes two huge mistakes. Be unfaithful to the books, at least my boss told me so. Which also makes it even harder for the people who haven't read them to follow the plot of the movie. In fact, the test audiences for The Dark Tower even said it was confusing and messy, so the studios spent $6 million on reshoots to give Idris Elba's character a backstory. So that's $6 million spent on rushed, crappy editing, and a ton of exposition on who he is and how this world works. And yet the movie was still confusing and messy. In fact, the gunslinger's a side character in this, the kid's the main star, so there's not even enough time to focus on the gunslinger as a character. Matthew McConaughey has given more effort into Lincoln commercials than this movie, and Tom Taylor, as the kid, pretty much whispers most of his performance, probably so he could hide his British accent. I hear that they were going to make a Dark Tower TV show as a sequel to this movie, but Idris Elba and Matthew McConaughey have both done TV shows in the past. Why didn't they just start with a TV show? The Mummy does pretty much the exact same things that make the Dark Tower bad. Tons and tons of monologues about who each character is and the universe they're trying to set up, serviceable acting from actors who are a lot better than that, but what makes this one harder to sift through was that whoever wrote this script seriously thought it was a good idea to make this scary monster movie funny. The only time I remember laughing was when Russell Crowe was trying to be Jekyll and Hyde. I'm taking a wild guess that that was supposed to be creepy, right? I, I love Tom Cruise, but just stick with Mission Impossible, okay? The original Flatliners was cheesy, and it wasn't as smart as it thought it was, but it was still a nice-looking, well-acted, and kind of creepy movie. The remake would have been a lot better if the studios had just let Neil Zoplev make the kind of movie that he wanted to. One that builds up the scare's intention as opposed to just scaring people with loud noises. And maybe include characters that are new and fresh as opposed to ones that are repetitive to anyone who's seen the original movie, and just bland and boring to anyone who hasn't. I'm not kidding when I say this, when I was coming up with movies to put on my worst of the year list, I forgot that I had even seen The Circle. I had to go back and watch my old review, one that nobody saw, and frankly they didn't need to, to remind myself why this movie was bad. And then, I wish I, that I went back to forgetting. Most of the side actors in this movie are trying either too hard to be creepy or just look embarrassed to be there. Emma Watson's character is incredibly naive when it came to why she thought mass surveillance was a good thing, even though there was stuff about it that she wasn't okay with. And the ending, even though it makes it seem like all these big secrets that were just revealed are going to have a huge impact on the world, in the last shot, it turns out they don't. The fuck was the point of that? I'm curious to see what happened in the behind the scenes of this movie, but whatever it was, it just didn't work. Alright folks, so, the number one worst movie, one that, not gonna lie, I was entirely convinced was gonna be my worst of the year anyways, is... <coughs> fucking Sandy Wexler. For the record, Sandler, every time I laughed at one of your jokes, I was faking it. The nicest thing I can say about Sandy Wexler is that it's nowhere near as gross or self-serious in its message as the do-over. However, no other movie this year has pissed me off over how many terrible performances, no matter how many awkward and annoying characters, any cheap or shameless product plugs, or a story that is boring and goes on for fucking ever. Sandy Wexler as a character, I guess you're supposed to feel sorry for him because he's a geek with an incredibly annoying voice. This has got to be one of the most annoying Sandler characters I've ever seen. And I guess you're supposed to feel bad for him because no one likes him or wants to work with him. Well, here's a crazy idea. Maybe if you didn't lie your ass off to all of your clients and included them 
with how you get them work, maybe they would want to work with you. As per every Sandler comedy, the jokes are immature, sophomoreish, and easy. And then all of a sudden it gets dark at like the worst times. There are scenes where a clown commits suicide or a woman tries to seduce somebody in front of her vegetative husband. And there's supposed to be humor in those scenes. For no fucking reason. There was so much filler in it too. Like if it focused on the relationship between Sandy and that one singer, which is the main plot of the movie, it could have been cut a half hour short and I would have at least been... Well, I wouldn't have been okay with it, but it would have spared me a half hour of just waiting for my TV to load. I don't want to hate Adam Sandler. He's capable of good work. I've heard a lot of good things about the Mayor Witz stories, which is also on Netflix. But I haven't watched it because I still haven't been able to get Sandy Wetzler out of my fucking head. So can you blame me for not even watching it? Look, Sandler, I want to like you again, but for fuck's sakes, quit it with this Happy Madison bullshit. Let someone else be behind the camera in the creative process. Just stay out of it. You're not in the creative process of, host, of Hotel Transylvania movies, and people like that more than this, so keep more at it with that. By the way, fire that manager of yours that tried to grab Terry Crews' junk. Well, guys, thanks as always for watching all the way through. What are some of the worst movies that you've seen this year? Whatever they are, be sure to let me know in the comments below. And if you'd like to see it, be sure to check out my description for my best of the year list. Be sure to like, subscribe, check out my other reviews at noperfectmovie.com. And once again, thank you all very much for watching. Take care.